And uh, one of the powerful poems in here is a poem about uh, the guitarist, uh, the folk musician of great fame in Chile, Victor Jara. If you could introduce that poem and read it for us, I think that would be wonderful. Absolutely. Uh, Victor Jara was the foremost practitioner of Chilean New Song, part of the Chilean New Song movement in Chile. Uh, there was a cultural renaissance in the early 1970s with the election of the socialist president, Salvador Allende, who, of course, was overthrown uh, September 11, 1973, in the military coup bought and paid for by the Nixon administration. Um, aside from Allende, the most prominent victim of that coup was Victor Jara, uh, who was taken to one of the uh, soccer stadiums uh, there by the military in Santiago and ultimately executed. Uh, now, if you go to Chile today, you'll see that that same stadium is named for Victor Jara, and I returned uh, with his wife, Joan Jara, to the very place where he was assassinated. And that was the genesis of this poem. It's uh, in four parts, and it's called Something Escapes the Bonfire for Victor and Joan Jara. One, because we will never die, June 1969. Victor sang his peasant's prayer. Levántate y mírate las manos. Stand up and look at your hands, gloved in hard skin, the hands of Victor's father, petrified into fists, steering the plow. Estalio Chile cheered, delirious as a man who knows he has plowed his last field for someone else, who hears a song telling him what he knows at the back of his neck. Joan the dancer who twirled before crowds in the same shanty towns where Victor sang, leaned forward in his seat to hear it. First prize at the new song festival for Victor Jara. These are the nights we do not sleep because we will never die. How then could he squint into the dark somewhere beyond the back row, raise his guitar and sing, we'll go together, united by blood, now and in the hour of our death. Amen. Two, The Man with All the Guns, September 1973. The coup came and soldiers whipped the enemies of the state hands on head in single file through the stadium gates. Condemned faces bled their light in the halls of Estadio Chile. The light floats there still. The killers had their light too, spectral cigarettes glimmering in every corridor, especially the prince, or so the prisoners call the blonde officer who smiled at his work as if churches sang in his head. When Victor slipped into the hallway, away from thousands gripping knees to chest as they awaited the cigarette in the neck or stared back at the staring machine guns, he met the prince, who must have heard singing in his head since he recognized the singer's face, strummed the air, and slashed a finger across his throat. The prince smiled like a man with all the guns. Later, when the other prisoners realized there were no wings on their shoulders to fly them from the firing squad, Victor sang, Venceremos, we will win, and the band anthem lifted shoulders as the prince's face reddened in a scream. If his own scream could not quiet the song pulsing through the veins in his head, reason the prince, then the machine guns would. Three, if only Victor... July 2004. Crack the face of every clock at Estadio Chile. In this place, 31 years are measured by Victor's last breath. A moment, as in momento, the last word of the last canto he wrote before the bullets swarmed into the honeycomb of his lungs. Her eyes still burn. Her tongue still freezes. Again for Joan, the helicopters roar. Military music drums across the dial. Soldiers rifle butt women in the breadline. Again she finds her husband's body in the morgue, amid the corpses piled like laundry, and lifts his dangling fractured hands in hers as if to begin a waltz. 
Yes. Now they have named the stadium where he was killed for him. Yes. His words flow in stone across the wall of the lobby. Yes. There are Chinese acrobats tumbling here tonight. Yet she would rip away the sign flourishing his name, hammer down the wall of his words, and scatter the acrobats into the streets if only Victor would walk into the room to finish their argument about why he moved so slowly in the morning that he almost always made her late for class. 4. Something Escapes the Bonfire, July 2004 south of Santiago, far from Estadio Victor Jara, under a tent where the spikes of rain rattle off the canvas, a boy and girl, born years after the coup, lean across a chair on stage to fill their eyes with each other's faces. The tape rumbles, and Victor's voice spirals, delicate as burnt paper to the ceiling, singing of a lover's silence to the dancers who uncurl the tendrils of their bodies. Something escapes the bonfire where the generals warm their hands, embers from burnt paper, buried tapes, voices teeming in the silence like the invisible creatures in a glass of water, how a dancer spins to the music in her head, alone, but for the tingle of fingertips at her elbow. Wow, that's Martina Spada reading Something Escapes the Bonfire for Victor and Joan Jara in The Republic of Poetry, a collection of Martina Spada's poems that uh, were nominated for the Pulitzer Prize. What was it like to be there with Joan? It was, uh, it was uh, stunning. We sat for a long time um, looking down. And, you know, the, the word stadium in some ways is kind of a misnomer because they use that word to describe, uh, uh, in this case, a place that's much smaller. You know, the, we use the word stadium to mean a big place. This is more like an arena. I mean, it held 5,000 people. And so imagine it was packed with 5,000 prisoners, including Victor, uh, at the time. And um, what I was most struck by was the fact that for Joan Jara, this may as well have happened yesterday. It all came back to her, and her eyes filled with tears, and, and there were lots of silences and pauses. And then eventually she began to talk, and it was clear that uh, all the accolades in the world uh, didn't matter, uh, couldn't compensate for the loss of uh, her husband. And we tend to forget sometimes when we're talking about political figures that they're also human beings. And we have to remember that human landscape, that emotional landscape, um, because those icons like Victor Hara are, are a part of that landscape. Well, too. that's why the late for class line is so immediate and, and personal and every day uh, yes. that we all can relate to. The other thing that speaks from this poem is a theme of yours that no matter how repressive the state may be uh, about art, about poetry, that uh, you can't silence the song, that the art is going to get out one way or another. Yes, people can make art out of anything. And when I think of what he did, um, how he was singing to keep up the spirits of his fellow inmates, how he was writing this final poem, um, which um, ultimately made its way out, uh, and among other things was turned into a song by... Arlo Guthrie, uh, you know, the, the courage that was demonstrated it comes, I think, directly from principle. You know, this was a, a principled man taking a principled stand, and, and his wife has continued that tradition with something called the Fundación Victor Jara in Chile. Uh, 